<laughs> We're going to move through uh, this, this part, the last part of this PowerPoint, because I have one that's specific to center hall occupancies. That's the one that I think some of you saw, Corey, you saw it. Um, so it'll get in a little bit deeper on specifically on center halls. Um, so multifamily dwellings in general, let's talk about search, rescue, and evacuation. So essentially addressing the life hazard. So do you guys have SOPs or do you train on how do we prioritize uh, life safety, life hazard? Who do we, who, do, who are we going after first? And Chief, you and I talked about this. One of the best ways to address it uh, really easily is to take the hazard away, right? If we take away the fire, everything gets better. And sometimes that's the best option. Uh, but if we had enough resources and we are going to assign a primary search, what's the algorithm? And I would ask you guys and have people volunteer, but I already put it up there. So we go after the most threatened first. So whoever's generally close to the fire. Um, what's that? From, so let's say it's on the first floor. Uh, people on the first floor most threatened. Uh, and then, then who's next? Definitely above, and then it's going to be top floor. If you have a big separation, the people on the top floor, and there's a bunch of distance between the fire, they're actually going to be most threatened because that's where the smoke will go. Um, so we, we prioritize people based on how threatened they are by the fire. And that's an important thing about, especially if you show up and you've got a victim in the window. One of the things you have to think about is how threatened are they? Then we're going to go after the greatest number. So. Um, in a multifamily dwelling, we have a lot of people. That's what makes it really hazardous. So there might be opportunities to save one person, but we do it at the expense of risking a whole bunch of other people, right? So uh, that's going to be a tough decision at some, uh, possibly at some time, but that might be what we do. And then we worry about people and exposure. So that, how, do we, how do we address that? What are the tactics? Uh, rescue. Uh, so we can do a primary search and rescue the people. Like I mentioned, fire attack can be um, a tactic that actually addresses this. Evacuation. So for us, uh, the dip difference between that and rescue is evacuation is there's, it's not ideal H. I just need to shepherd people out or get them out of there. And this is something that you can use ancillary people as sort of a force multiplier. So. Cops always want to do something. Hey, go evacuate that building over there or that wing or, but be very clear with them because you know what cops are going to want to do. Is anyone here a cop, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, they're going to they're going to dive right in, and uh, so we. I mean, <laughs> we've had so many close calls with cops. It's ridiculous. Uh, one of the other things we can do, and this is going to be a really uh, highly probable tactic for us, is sheltering in place. If you get a center hall fire going, fire enters the hallway, and the hallway is untenable for a civilian, they're unlikely to go out there. Some people might. They might risk it. They'll go out. Our Logger Creek fire, we had two people go out in the hallway, almost got overcome. One lady went back into her apartment, closed the door. The other one actually made it to the fire door and made it out. Um, but most people are going to stay in their apartment, and we'll just leave them there. Because remember, it's a rated fire assembly. And unless we force the door open or uh, they leave it open for some reason, they should be pretty safe. So uh, with these scenarios, we're going to, uh, we already know, like, uh, OK. Uh, some of the things we need to think about, too, we know it's a multifamily dwelling, so there's a lot of potential, but time of day becomes a factor, too. So uh, nighttime, we're definitely going to have more people. And we're going to look at reports from bystanders. So what I want you to do, I'm going to show you some scenarios here, and I want you to tell me what tactic you're going to use uh, to address the rescue or address the life hazard. So, oh, do I just hit this? Is it going? Yep. And I need to go, hold on a second. Oh, damn it. 
damn it. Okay, let me ask you, how threatened is it, are these people there? Not very. Not very. So, I applaud their initiative, but um, what would you prioritize first? Rescuing that person? Fire tech. Right, because is it conceivable there could be someone in that apartment there? What have you done for them? Have you done them any favors? No. Uh, it is, this is going to be a really difficult thing because they're going to be very animated and they're going to want help right now. And you may have to be, it may be a very difficult conversation with them, but hey, stay put, we'll get you in a bit. And worry about getting water on that fire and that starts saving a lot of people's lives potentially. People up there, there could be someone trapped in a bedroom in the back there. And as you get manpower, if you have opportunity, maybe your, your driver operator can throw a ladder. That's a single person throw, piece of cake, they can come out. Now, um, I believe, how about this one here? How threatened is this person who's looking out the window wondering what all the fire engines are doing out there in the parking lot? What's that? Shelter in place. Yeah. I mean, the fire, I, I would guess, this floor is a low priority because uh, the fire is going to be moving that direction first. Isn't that a firewall right between the two? It could be, yeah. And if it is, then they're even less, right? So don't candle moth to a person that's crying for help. Um, you could have a reverse stack effect uh, where that's pushing smoke down. Then that does become a little bit more of an issue. But still, they should probably be okay inside their room. Now, uh, I'm not telling you to totally ignore people in Windows, but you need to evaluate what's going on. So you're on your... With limited resources. With limited res yes. I think with limited resources, taking the hazard away is probably your default, should be your default mindset. Now, I come around the corner on a 360, get to the Charlie side, there's someone in the window screaming for help and there is black boiling smoke coming out over their head. Now, yeah, now I'm gonna go for the rescue. And hopefully their able bodied can get out on the ladder themselves, might have to assist them. Hopefully they don't become overcome by the smoke uh, and I have to go in and, and pull them out. If that's the case, our standard VES uh, process where we isolate the door, right? Um, how about this guy? No? I don't know, he looks pretty comfy there. Um, but he's pretty threatened, right? Because he's below the fire. I don't really know where the fire is. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't going to wait for us to rescue him. And this guy actually lived. Um, there was, you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can see Cyrillic alphabet. That this is from Russia, so he probably felt those guys are pretty, pretty hardy. They, he probably thought he had a pretty good chance. He just wanted to protect what was most important. He was prioritizing too. Uh, allegedly, there were some people that put out a blanket or something and helped kind of break the fall. All, and also, allegedly, his family was still in there. So, yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. Um. Did you say skip this one or? Okay. All right. So, what type of apartment do we have here? It's an alcove, yeah. And you can tell an alcove, uh, there's some cues on whether it's front side, back side. If it's rather shallow, um, like you don't go too far into the building, it's, there's a good chance there could be one on the, on the Charlie side. But if it goes really deep into the building, Unlikely, because you, the building's not big enough to accommodate two really deep alcoves. So you also might look for sidewalks that go around. Um, we'll say this is front side, back side. I don't really know, but is this a video? I have a video of this, but this isn't. So they are opting for VES. Um, <clears throat> what do you guys think? Fire attack. Mm -hmm. Fire attack, right? 
Yeah. And I'm not beating up on these guys because um, I think in the video you can see there's an engine there too, uh, but it takes a bit of time. I think these are the latter guys that are doing this. So they might have gotten reports that there's people trapped in there. And that's, yeah, if someone in there, we want to get them out pretty quick. But if I was a single resource showing up, um, I might go in there and potentially save someone, but now I've got these people, these people, and these people all threatened, right? Mm -hmm. And the fire, I might lose the entire building. Plus, it's very dangerous for you to not engage that fire. And be able to yes, and if you see the video, that you'll see the fire actually creeps along here. I think it even lights the smoke off, possibly. But it, it, yeah, the, it's it, it was uh, pretty bold uh, and. Um, aggressive and that's good but I don't know all the details so um, they do have, they do have an engine getting uh, water on the fire relatively quick uh, I'm gonna skip ventilation and roof port. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it in the center hall stuff uh, we talked a little bit at, Aaron talked about it with um, some of the fires we had and I think even with this picture here so just a reminder of how we can size that up. Water supply, not going to go into this a lot. Um, but one of the things to think about for you, because you guys will be getting your own water su supply, correct? <clears throat> Try not to block access. So <clears throat> are you guys looking for hydrants as you come in? Okay. Duty and will be looking for that as it comes in. Okay, duty officer will? Okay. And what we try and tell our guys is try and find two hydrants. The closest one isn't always the best because the closest one might block off everyone's access. So look for the best hydrant, not necessarily the closest because it can look really nice and it can look like this. So on our first Edgewater fire, the one that we had talked about, uh, engine 16 was second and they did a fantastic job really disciplined uh, of laying the, the supply line off to the side of the road as they laid in. And uh, that gave access for the truck to get in and the ambulance, the BC. Uh, laddering, all I want to say about that is a uh, proactive mindset versus reactive. Uh, there's a lot of people in here. There's going to be our own people in here. And if we need a ladder uh, for rescue a firefighter or someone else uh, if they aren't already close by it's probably going to be it could be too late so we want to see his ladders everywhere now this is Colorado Springs so and they have a really strong ladder culture they are really good at ladders we had them uh, we essentially picked up their program and had them train us and uh, we're trying to get as proactive as they are any questions on <coughs> multifamilies and dwelling, what we've covered so far? Okay, we're going to move on to the center hall PowerPoint. Well, he's pulling that up. I'm, and I know that sometimes it takes a while for your second in to get there, or maybe you're getting Ontario coming to assist or something. Um, as you know, we, we end up having maydays and issues during overhaul and things like that. If it's a multi-story building, you're like, well, the fire is out. That's a great assignment to give Ontario or later arriving. Hey, let's get some ladders where people are operating on that upper floor, that second or third floor, right? So it's, a, it's a good practice to get into. We actually um, are looking at making it more of an SOP for like later arriving units that it's multi-story. These specific units are tasked with ensuring we have ladders. Awesome. All right. Uh, this is this is the class uh, I taught uh, last fall for um, our battalion training. Um, it's focused just on center halls. Some of these slides are going to be redundant. I pirated this from the guy who was on the cover there, uh, Barnard, um, took his and kind of modified. Um, so that's why you'll see all these weird graphics and stuff. 
We're just going to review, we're not going to review the building construction fire protection features. We might discuss them a little bit, but we're mostly going to focus on tactics and strategy. Um, we know what center hall multifamily dwellings are, and what makes these particularly hazardous is everyone's egress path is through an interior hallway, interior space that could be overcome by fire and or smoke. <clears throat> Uh, error implications, so um, error is going to drive the construction methods and also it will tell us about the fire protection features. So protected stairwell, probably not. Protected stairwell, yeah. The building construction, um, these are generally going to be, I don't know what kind, what types of uh, construction types are representative around here, but I'm guessing most of them would be uh, ordinary or wood frame. Could be, have some non-combustible. Uh, eras, do any of you guys have older center hall uh, multifamily dwellings in your jurisdictions? Like the, you'd have um, like an old ordinary, something like that, okay. So again, that has implications for the fire protection features and the construction, et cetera. Generally, um, the older you're going to have mass over math, so it's going to be sturdier, but you won't have the fire protection features. The newer you'll have the fire protection features, but it's lightweight. So if those fire protection features aren't working, then we risk uh, collapse a lot earlier. We talked about all this stuff. It's dependent, it's about uh, how it was built, the code at the time of construction, and also adoption and enforcement in your area. And um, also occupancy type, we talked about the difference between R1 and R2, so transient use is gonna be, have more, more code restrictions or more code provisions than an R2, where people live there, they know the way out, et cetera. Uh, these are the ones that we want to think about in particular with center hall. So the firewalls, if it's really long, you'll have, probably have it separated into two fire areas um, with a firewall, fire door in, um, in line with the, uh, the firewall. The fire and draft stopping, that'll be particularly important in uh, the wood frame constructed ones. Uh, Self-closing doors. This is this is going to be pretty important too because when we address the life safety hazard, uh, we're kind of relying on those self-closing doors if we're going to shelter in place. Protected stairwells. That's a big decision point for you. If you don't have a protected stairwell, that will could determine what you're going to do with your uh, tactics. And then, does it have sprinklers or not? And where we're going today does not have sprinklers. All right, the difficulties, access, um, that's access. It also implies uh, egress for occupants. Access, generally, um, your access points are going to be on Bravo and Delta to get into the building. You might have access problems with parking and um, just the, uh, the parking lot itself, access in. But then you've got to get up to the floor and make it down the hallway. You've got a high life hazard, fire spread, fire can go from that apartment into the main egress path. You can also get into void spaces. Uh, fire attack, and the reason I put that down as a difficulty is because if it is taking control of the hallway, that becomes a much more difficult situation to deal with because now we have to fire our way down the hall and then make it to the apartment to actually extinguish the fire. <clears throat> we talked about this, we've talked a lot about multifamily dwellings. It's a high risk, low frequency thing, but it's frequent enough that we probably ought to know what we're doing with them, right? Okay, tactical considerations, we're gonna talk about three things. We're gonna talk about addressing the life hazard, fire attack, and ventilation. And probably spend most of our time talking about fire attack. 
So addressing the life hazard, uh, what are our options for, for this? <coughs> kind of already said it, but. Remove the, hazard, remove, the remove the hazard, remove the people, yeah. So if we're gonna remove the people, we have to do a primary search, go ahead and find them. Uh, we could evacuate them if they're less threatened, those are lower priority people, so use your less, um, Skilled people, don't waste your resources on that. Give that to ancillary people like the cops or even a bystander or maybe a building rep could, could uh, do that. VES, if pathways are uh, blocked off through the interior, we can do VES. Although uh, if people are in their apartment and they're protected by their, their door, it should be pretty good for them for the time being. There might be times where uh, VS would be appropriate. Uh, ground ladder rescue, so this is just like you've got people out on balconies uh, or you have a, some in a window, that's just easy. Someone throws a ladder and they can come down uh, or you can use the aerial. So what, what are the chances that we could get an aerial to one of these, uh, one of these occupancies? We you got know. one, uh, Vail got one, we have one. Weezer got one, and Ontario, you guys getting yours fixed yet? Yes and no. <laughs> it's still pretty crappy. So we can get three aerials. Much. Yeah, and I don't know if I would prioritize that with, I would rather have a lot of personnel there early, uh, because by the time the aerial got there, it probably would be pretty late. I mean, if it's going defensive, yeah, you're going to want it. But. So the only thing for consideration is us at Bale, we it's our first dude, it's the very oh. first showing up. So it's one thing we do have to think about. Nice, yeah. Well that, yeah, that you should work that into kind of run some scenarios through your head of how, that, how you, you would We're use that. We're trying to work on how to get all that squared away and trying to mix the two roles. Here. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a common problem. But it does, I think it's a good, it's probably a good resource for you guys to have. Uh, shelter in place. Oh, I was meant to delete that slide, but I didn't. All right, fire attack. So the goal, we want to get water on the fire as quick as possible. We want to keep it from getting where it's going. Uh, we'll talk about strategy, tactics, and tactics. So uh, fire attack strategy. So did anyone say they're familiar with Reese OVS? Does anyone use that? It's really, I'm not an acronym guy, but it's the one that I really like because it's pretty time tested and it's, it essentially prioritizes uh, how you're going to uh, strat your strategy for uh, a fire. You start with rescue. That's our number one incident priority. So you gotta you gotta be not necessarily that you're going to do it first, but that should be your first thing is how we're going to deal with the life hazard. But from there, we're going to deal with the fire problem, and we always start kind of outward and work in. We start with exposures because I'd rather have one building on fire than two, right? Um, once I've ensured that I don't have exposure problems, then I'm going to confine the fire to where it's at in that building, and then I'm going to extinguish it. And once I've extinguished it, I'm going to overhaul. So the tactics that go along with that, kind of put exposures and confinement together, because exposures, typically there's going to be pretty, enough, pretty big enough uh, fire protection distances or, or setbacks that another building on fire isn't a big deal unless you have a defensive fire and you got fire brands showering, you know, the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, so confinement, <clears throat> um, what that's gonna look like, we can reset the fire, right? We can use doors. The doors are there to compartmentalize the fire. We can use that actually as a tool to, for, for our fire attack strategy. And we can also use ventilation. Now, again, we talked about this with the balloon frame, right? And we talked about, I don't know if he'd mentioned it with the ordinary, but one of the old common tactics with a uh, ordinary constructed multi-story building is send a truck to the roof early to cut a hole to direct the fire up there so it's not spreading through all of the void spaces. Same with a balloon frame. Um, Got to be careful with that, though, because you are allowing that fire to breathe and now it can, can grow big. But if you do have hose lines in place, and this is a tactic, if you had enough, um, enough um, 
personnel, ventilation could work really well to confine the fire and keep it from going to certain places. We'll talk about that in a bit. Extinguishment, that's just stretching your attack line, all right? You might have to have multiple lines though. So, but what's the most important line? If you had to choose between a backup line and a stalled initial attack line, where, where are you gonna direct your resources? You gotta get that initial attack line in place. That's, that should be the highest priority. Overhaul, we need to open voids. That's a, a key one, we have to open the voids and especially the attic, and then we overhaul all the stuff that was burning. Um, this is just a video of our guys resetting with a deck gun. Uh, I was talking with Chief and with Corey about resetting with uh, your command vehicles. I love it. I'm gonna put in a request to get one on my BC rig. But you can see with that deck gun, they're able to reach the fifth floor of our old tower and it's starting to break up a bit there. And they shot it actually up to what would have been the sixth floor. And uh, it's broken up a little bit. That's a lot of water going there. It's, it's probably gonna have a pretty good effect on that fire. The only thing I would say about the deck gun, and I did this on the Edgewater fire, you have to spot in a certain location to make it work. And where I spotted, took away the truck's prime real estate to go to the roof. So they were using ground ladders. So um, it's a great tool. It's not the be all end all though. All right, the fire attack line, it starts with, I can't stretch a line somewhere unless I know where that somewhere is. So you gotta have good recon. Uh, Actually, it really starts with discipline apparatus spotting. And um, we'll talk about this. this I, um, I didn't quite know the limitations of, of resources, so you guys will have to sort of uh, take this with a grain of salt because for us, it's a real problem having undisciplined companies uh, pulling in and blocking access for other companies, later arriving companies. <clears throat> so we want to make sure we're spotting appropriately to maintain access. And it's also really important for our stretch. So I don't want to park on Bravo and then stretch all the way down to Delta and then go in through Delta, right? So we want to spot the best we can first. That starts with recon. So any doubt where the fire is at, right? Second floor and kind of midway, you can't see there's a, like a, the entrance is right here. So it's probably halfway down the hallway, right? What about this one? Now you might be really good at reading smoke, but in the middle of the night, you don't have a lot of good light. You don't even know where you're going, right? So don't start stretching until you know where you're going. And even with something like this, you might know where that's at, but what is the pathway in there? is are the stairs easily accessible from this door? That one uh, I showed you, Center Hall, it was in my district, the one with the Arborvitas. On the Bravo side, the stairwell spills out to Alpha. On the Delta side, it goes, uh, spills out to the Charlie side. So that, that adds a little bit of complication. And so if I wanted to go to Charlie, uh, I would have to know that ahead of time for through pre-planning or I'd have to do some recon and figure out how I'm gonna get the hose uh, over there. Here's uh, the spawning. So for you guys, you're gonna have one engine arrive and <clears throat> for us, if it's not obvious, we oftentimes will park right in front because that gives us a chance to go in and check the panel and we can read the panel. If it's not entirely clear that we have something, we see some smoke, check the panel like, oh, yeah, we've got like half a dozen smoke detectors going off. There's something real here. We also can talk to the RP and another arriving engine will come in, stage at the hydrant, and we need to, uh, we wanna make our stretches as efficient as possible. So it's either gonna be Bravo, Bravo or Delta, right? So I'm gonna spot an apparatus there. That might be 
my engine, the first in, or might be the next one arriving. So call over the radio like, hey, engine uh, three, uh, spot on Delta for, uh, for fire attack. I like the fact that you got your hydrants marked. Yeah. Uh, and this is off of one of our multiple maps that we have that does show the, your hydrants show up on your map? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, the, and you should be thinking about that as you're, as you're coming in. Uh, it sounds like your duty chief does that. Uh, so, or it could, you tell them to park on the Bravo side. Or it could be you, like you tell your driver, stay here, we can go check the panel. Uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of recon, and then I'm gonna have you reposition to wherever I say. It could be there, it could be there. We wanna leave room for, and then you need someone at the uh, hydrant. You guys are gonna take your own water supply though. We want to leave room, though, for the trucks. If you do it, need an aerial. Uh, but <clears throat> I know I'm talking in terms of, of stuff that's probably more relevant for us, but access is still important for you because what if you end up having, I don't know, a uh, half a dozen people with smoke inhalation, maybe some that are critical, and now the ambulance has to park all the way out here because we were really undisciplined in how we, we spotted. Maintain access, it's absolutely critical. If you're not needed, if your apparatus isn't doing a job on the fire ground, stay out. It's, you're, all you are is a taxi. All right, the fire attack line. You have, you have a few choices here you need to think about. Am I gonna do a direct stretch up the stairs or am I gonna do a vertical stretch? Do you get, does anyone practice vertical stretches? Oh, well good, that actually makes this easier. I, I am a fan of them in certain applications, but not a lot. And uh, a center hall occupancy is one where I'm not a huge fan. <clears throat> I'll show you why. Uh, your next decision you're gonna make, am I gonna do a stairwell stretch or a hallway? Meaning, am I laying my working line out in the hallway? Or is the hallway not a good place to be laying it out so I have to lay it out in the stairwell? And then we'll talk about standpipes, but probably not much. So, center hall, uh, here's a vertical stretch. You think, oh, this is gonna be super quick, so uh, I'll bring my hose line up, I'll dump it out that window. Well, there's a few problems here. One, you're stretching through th this uh, apartment, you have to go around furniture and stuff. It's, it's kind of messy and a pain. Uh, but what about this? So, fire was in that apartment, door was left open, and it gets away from you. As you're setting it up, you haven't got water yet. That's, that's not good, right? So um, it puts you in a bad spot. Now you could set it up in that apartment, right? Shut the door if you need to. Shut the door, right. But now, besides just stretching past all the furniture, you've got to lay out all your working line. That's going to be a nightmare. Furthermore, we all know about flow path, right? You have um, an intake and an exhaust. And the relative height of the two oftentimes is probably the, the biggest factor in, in what determines which one's gonna be which. If you have two that are on the same level, then one or the other will be the exhaust. Well, that, this could be the exhaust. And if I have to retreat because I've got a flow path coming this way, and I've already stretched my line of the hallway, I can't close the door, right? So now we're all jumping out the window. Maybe you've got a balcony that but if I'm in a stairwell, at least I can retreat down the stairs, right? I could abandon my hose line and, and uh, go there. It so gets. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, so with that being your attack line, if you needed another 50 or 100 foot section on there, there in Boise, do you guys carry a hose bundle to attach at the nozzle, or do you do it off the engine? No, and that's one of the problems with this is, once you have this set up, like if you short stretched, you're kind of, it, it is hard to recover from. You're, you are trying to hoist a uh, charged hose line up and it's tied off. So it's, that's one of the limitations to it. We just really work on getting it right, done, done right the first time. And if we do it a direct stretch up the stairwell, we can recover uh, from that a little bit better. It will take a few more people to work the corners, but we always have some reserve uh, out, out of the building. 
But to answer your question, we would always uh, stack from the nozzle forward. We can unscrew the tip. Yeah, yeah. Do it from the nozzle forward because you can imagine if you did the truck, now you got to move all if it's charged, especially like that's a little bit. Well, I just saw a YouTube video of a department in California doing that. And it was the first time I'd seen it because we've always talked about from the nozzle. Yeah. Extending it that way. And, and what do they do? They break uh, it and. They um, ended up, um, they had their pre connect, and then they, it looked like they disconnected at the engine and kept on adding sections because you could see where they kept on pulling. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. How, it how, how did it go in the video? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? How did it look in the video? Well, it was the first time I'd seen it like that. It wasn't yeah. charged. So it wasn't charged. Yeah. Still, yeah. yeah. Then you have all that hose you've got to pull somewhere and put somewhere. But this, is, this is why I say the recon is so important. And we, our officers are pretty good at estimating stretches, and they give themselves a little bit of a, a fudge factor. But you don't want to bring so much more just to be safe because too much hose can be an issue too. Now, are we talking like a room of content kind of fire off of this room itself? Yeah, I mean, uh, room and content that could have spread it into the hallway. Either way, okay. um, you, but we'd want to know how our first line has to get to the involved room. Now, if other rooms get going, that might be a second attack line. Um, there probably will be enough uh, to make it a little bit further, but I would expect a second line uh, at some point once we get a initial knockdown. Hey Mike, what we want to mention and for you guys to think about, uh, we were talking to the chief on that break there, and where you have a single engine and you're getting your own water supply, you think about how we would potentially that first engine go to the address side, hop off, start looking at the panel, reposition that rig, and second dude's bringing you water. Well, you're in a little bit different environment, right? So I don't know if it's best if you hook your hydrant, Go to the front and your engineer is kind of waiting at the rig you haven't committed to hooking it to the rig the officer jumps in tries to get some recon and then says all right continue to bravo or whatever so you're still laying out i, I don't know if that's the best way to go about it since you don't have second in necessarily bringing new water is that what what do you guys think yeah we wouldn't commit i mean if we knew where it was and we were positioned right then we would commit but if we got there you know, the, the hose would still be on the back of the truck and one of the uh, duty officer or the captain on that rig would go in and look at that. That uh, makes panel. sense to me, yeah. Okay. Well, that may, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I know I've been throwing out a lot of caveats, and one of the big caveats of, of this class and the drills is, uh, I don't know you guys' system as well as you do, and I, and, you guys need to test and kind of practice some of this stuff. So the duty chief checking the panel makes a ton of sense to me. Um, and, you know, the whole water supply issue, there's going to be, you guys are going to practice it and figure out efficiencies that, that make sense for you. Uh, one last point on this with the vertical stretch. With that flow path, it becomes even more of an issue if we have a little bit of wind coming in. Um, now there are people, and the reason I had this slide up here is because vertical stretches seem like they've been kind of trendy for a while and um, everyone's excited about them. And they work well, and I've seen dozens of iterations of, of this actual drill. And um, some people that do the vertical stretch, it, it looks great. Uh, others do it, it looks, it's a complete nightmare. But what makes the difference, whether it's this or just a direct stretch up the stairwell is whether they've practiced it as a crew. And as important, they've practiced communicating that plan with their crew and with anyone else that's helping them. Because oftentimes this ends up being, it's not a, a, it's not a two person job. It's gonna be, I mean, you'd have to be really badass firefighters for it to be a two fire, I mean, Possibly, but um, we usually have two companies assigned to this. And it's the ones that practice it and know what they're doing and can communicate it that make the difference. That's really what, what uh, makes the difference. The way we do it, I will tell you this. Um, 
I'm hesitant to say like this is the best way to do it, but I do know one best practice, at least for us, is we take our 100 foot bundle with us on recon. We recon, we find the fire, captain gives his follow up report, maybe makes some other assignments, tells his husband, get that thing laid out. I want a hallway stretch to the fire door, or I want a stairwell stretch. And firefighters laying that out, he calls on radio to the second company or to his driver. I need, uh, I need hose, the couplings at the second floor landing. And then they bring the hose up, they know exactly how far they have to go, and they bring it up and make the connection. That works pretty well. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. But for you guys, if you're doing it laying in like that, let's say your pre-connect is the one you're taking up in your bundle packs into three quarter, are you guys going to lay two and a half in to supply it? That way you've got a little bit more water, you just can supply it off another inch and three quarter. Inch and three quarter. Okay. Because we can go, our inch and three quarter is actually 1.88 inches. Oh. And the friction loss allows us, we can go 1,200 feet without any loss of uh, volume. Okay, let's get through this. Uh, so let's talk about you, what I've showed you here so far is a hallway stretch, which means I'm laying my working line out in the hallway because it's tenable. What if the hallway is, it's a dirty hallway. It's, it's not a safe place to, for us to be. Well, we're gonna set it up in the stairwell. In the landing? Yeah, and this is what it looks like. This is sort of our standard. We lay out, uh, and this is based off our high rise. It, you don't need 150 necessarily all the time. Use what you need, but we always start with 150. And we lay it out. Um, if it were a high rise operation, we'd go into the standpipe. But we lay out the first uh, section here. What we really do is we take the nozzle and the first bundle up, and we will lay up one, uh, a flake up one uh, flight of stairs. We won't go past that half landing because we do not want someone up here managing hose around this corner here when we open the door. We want everyone out of there. But you charge it uh, with someone keeping that up there and then he retreats down and then everyone takes a position on a corner. So it goes up, then it comes down here and then all of our exits is down here. Now this requires a number of people at corners so usually you're gonna have your uh, captain and firefighter on the nozzle. You'll have one person at this corner and one person at this corner and probably another person down here. And then you just advance down toward the what fire. About vertical wall stacking on the back side of that top landing? Because that would get you an extra uh, 8 to it, 10, 16 feet, depending on how you did it. Like you coiling it? You have to go around that corner if you just blunt it down off the wall straight down the stairs. Uh, so you're talking about coiling it up there? Or Sorry, you're going vertical? Just going vertical up to the ceiling and back down. If it's charged, it'll do it. If you practice it, yeah. And, and you're confident in it, that will help you. I mean, that, that reduces some of the manpower you need. Just thinking right? about how far down that hallway you got to go. Yeah. It did give you that first initial lunge down before you got to start working your corners down below. Yeah. And you would have less on that floor below. Uh, I think uh, that is great if you practice it and you're totally confident it's going to work. We, we try not to stack hose on walls. Um, and we're doing, do you guys do coils? We use coils in some applications. Usually it's going to be something like uh, the alcove balcony where it's a really small area. Some people want to stand it up, but when you stand it up, if it gets knocked over, it can, be, it can create a huge mess for you. One thing to point out, though, is you can see that delaying and negative demand power can be important because I don't care how strong you are. If you only have two people and you go pull there, once you hit that corner, yeah, you're stuck. Once you know, that door's open, now you're moving the stairway. Right. Mm -hmm. So making sure you have the man power to actually advance it. You can see where you're going to have to have people below to be able to advance that. Yeah. So um, we had mentioned the two and a half. I would probably not recommend two and a half. Two and a half gives us what? There's two, two advantages to the two and a half. Volume. Volume, what's the other thing it does for us? Especially if I've got a long center hall. There's the reason a gated white, you shut it down right there and add those right there too. You could, 
you can always downsize, um, which is a good technique once you've knocked it down. That's what a lot of the Southern California comp uh, apartments do. How about reach? Two and a half, you can get a lot further away, but it takes more staffing on that, that line. So I don't, I don't know if, if, if I would go. We don't hardly ever use it unless it's uh, a high rise, and that's because we're going to a stand pipe. You have to use two and a half for the stand pipe. Do you guys yes, okay, I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot about that on recon. Recon, uh, we take a bundle and we take uh, the uh, pecan. Between us and the truck, between the engine and the truck, the, there'll be a pecan, there will be uh, a hose bundle, 100 feet of hose, and there'll be forceful entry tools. Uh, and you guys all, do you guys all have ticks? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important one, too, because you open the door and it's really smoky. You can look down and see, like, oh, it's down there on the right, probably about halfway. Um, and then you notice this last part, have someone else bring up the supply to it. So you guys are bringing one coupling or one stick up with you or two of, okay. Is one, like, one guy carrying? Yeah. One, two, so depends what they call for. Okay. Uh, if it was your call, though, like, uh, I need you to, I need you to start fire attack on floor two. And you can see it's like, mm, it's probably like 75 feet down the hallway. So it would just be your decision? Yeah. Okay. Then whatever I see or rescue one is telling us to. Okay. Probably from going to be safe to have three sticks on top of whatever we got, either the 150 attack line or the 200 feet attack line. So this varies. Okay. So this is one of the things we're going to be looking at today is when you get assigned uh, as the primary fire attack, how are you going to get that hose line set up in an operation? And it can be, and I don't really care how you do it. Like I said, there's, I've seen a lot of great ways it done, it's been done. Uh, are you going to take up a certain amount of hose with you? Are you going to try and stretch all the way and then have the working line on your shoulder and, and do it? There's a bunch of ways to skin the cat. But that's what we want to see is some, uh, that you have a plan and you can communicate to your crew and whoever else needs to be a part of it. Uh, just about this, so the stairwell stretch versus the hallway. I'm going to show you some pictures when we're doing the drill, and it's open interpretation. A lot of these decisions, here's one right here. Am I going to do a stairwell stretch or the hallway stretch? Well, that is sort of a judgment call, and your judgment might be different than Cody's, and that's the way it is. Um, it's going to be based on experience and, um, you know, a lot of factors, but... Uh, I, I'm not saying one's right or wrong, unless it was really poor uh, judgment, you know. But, but I won't say that today because, I mean, it's make-believe land, and it's hard to tell from a picture. Uh, that's what it looks like from a stand. Oh, no, that's, that's what it looks like when we, when we do it. This is my favorite is we're setting this up uh, up here and having someone else bring it up to us. And a hallway stretch, same thing, setting it up. This one's even quicker because one guy can set that up, call for where you need the hose to show up to. Oopsie. <clears throat> and they just bring it right up to you. Dang you it. You guys get what he's saying. When he talks hallway stretch, it's like you open the door from the protective stairwell. It's light, smoke condition, fire apartment doors closed. Much quicker to dry stretch in the hallway, albeit more risky, but pretty quick to do that as opposed to the manpower needed for that stairwell stretch to be able to advance that line. If it's banked down in the stairway, that's where we're talking about a stairwell stretch. If it's just light smoke and the fire doors are holding and you feel like you can do a quick hallway stretch, less manpower, much quicker, right? That's the decision point he's talking about. And you really got to be thinking about not what it looks like now, but what it smells like five minutes from now. Yeah, and so what are the factors involved here? It's going to be what are conditions in the hallway? How long is it going to take to set this up? What will conditions be like before I finally have water coming out that nozzle? How long will it take for this supply to, to come up? And all part, part of all of that is how many people do I have? And also you might be measuring like, oh, it's so-and-so. This is going to take a while, right? Or, yeah, it's VSETH. He'll be done in like 30 seconds. So 
there a certain amount of smoke in that hallway where you're going to go in there and go to the room, or are you going to just stay at the office? This hall? is, I, I can't, this is one of those things where I can't give you an answer, and I don't want to give you a black and white. I want you to look at it and say, okay, I know that by the time I have this hose line operation, I'll be fine. Or like, ooh, it's dicey, I'm not going to risk it. Or it's dicey, but it's worth it because we've, there's a lot of people at risk or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I can give you a little bit of just like tangible experience to think about. Um, we had a fire that was uh, in the cock lock in the 6th and uh, the cock lock, mm -hmm. cock lock fire. And the uh, seventh floor mechanical room got going in the cock lock, was going over apartments. I was a second arriving DC on that. And as I went around the core, is a big podium building. As I went around through the different fire doors, because it was such a big building, you, you know when you can smell, you're like, oh, we got a fire. Mm -hmm. It's not just a little burnt food or something. So we knew we had a good fire, but the closer I got, um, that last set of fire doors, it was a light smoke condition. You could totally smell you had a good fire. But when we opened that last set of fire doors, it was banked down the floor. It was incredible how well those fire doors held the products down. I would have been totally comfortable dry stretching right there. In fact, they ended up hooking up to a standpipe connection on the floor as opposed to the protective sterile, which is pretty abnormal for us. But it was such a big building, that was the right play, right? So I guess my point in that is, yes, we were relatively close to the apartment, but we had good, intact fire doors that were doing their job. Mm -hmm. And we were prepared for that once they found the open the door and made the... It goes back to recon, right? Mike said that's one of the most important things. Yeah. Um, so standpipes, uh, you guys probably won't be dealing with a, a bunch. It seems like, oh, that'd be super quick, right? I would not go to the standpipe. We don't use standpipes till we get to the fifth floor above. And it's because uh, a standpipe is essentially a black box that water goes in and you hope water comes out the other end. But it's no guarantee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's debris in it. Uh, someone left some valve open somewhere. Um, it, there's, <laughs> we've had ones where uh, workers actually cut out a section of the pipe and never reported it. And uh, so, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm not saying never, because I'm about to get to a slide here pretty quick, where you might. But generally, just stretching up the stairs works. Um, we already talked about this. Okay, and this is where, where that case is. So remember what we said, whenever possible, don't breach uh, fire doors. But let's say I have a fire here. And to get there without going through the fire door is 235 feet. It's a little bit spooky to me committing guys down that far, as opposed to what if I came in here 75 feet, went through the door, and knocked it down. So you're dry stretching on the protected side of the fire door, like I was just describing. It's a very short stretch once you right. open it, and you know where your safety is. And I would, I would try and evacuate as many people as I could in this area, at least, you know, this end of it, before I did that. Uh, how about this? Now the fire's there, 150 feet versus 150 feet. Well, I'd probably choose uh, the first one. I'd probably choose this one. Now there's one other situation, Aaron talked about this. Um, I don't know if it has always been the standard to have a, a standpipe connection at the fire doors, but that's pretty much how it is now. And those have been poo-pooed for a long time. Remember, it was absolute heresy to talk about connecting to one of these standpipes on the floor versus from the protected stairwell. And there, there's good reason for that because uh, if you're retreating down the line, you get to hear, I'm like, oh, crap, where's the exit? Well, there's a fire door that you can pull shut behind you. And this is a place where I would definitely prioritize a backup line on the, the clean side of the uh, fire door. But So that might be, so look at look, this quick case here. So 150 feet, and I've got a standpipe right here. This might be one where I hook up there. I take a little bit of time, open the door to get in there, and conditions are okay enough that I can be there. Uh, and then I follow it up with a backup line right to there. So if those guys have to retreat, you just open the doors, 
we've got them protected until they get there and close the door. Um, anyone have like really long center hall occupancies like this? If not, they're common. You'll you'll get them, and then you'll start seeing things like this. This one. So just curious, yeah. would you feel better with your guys going all the way from the bottom end versus having a retreat point where your firewall's at on that one? Um, it's obviously it probably depends on the fire. Boy, it's this is a judgment call. Like, uh, do I really want to expose this part of the building with smoke? Um, it is going to be safer for us to to do that. Um, but I still have my hose line in the way when I try and close those fire doors. It, it'll provide some protection, but um, I don't know. I think that would just be a judgment call, and I can't tell you that. You, you start thinking of a 200-foot stretch, you get low on air. Like, even if you're following a hose line, that could be a little problematic. 75 foot, it makes me a lot more comfortable. Well, if that's both 150 foot where you can go out. And yeah, and I'd said, like, I, if we can keep that sh shut. Where's right. the front door? Uh, it is, I don't know. It's That's every time I've gone here, it's, uh, it's somewhere along this, this is the alpha side here, but it's really weird to get into. Okay. I'm going to keep moving. So ventilation, uh, horizontal or vertical are options and location of the vent opening is, is key. So with a center hall one, there's a couple things. Can you guys see this? Will someone put the light on for me? So conventional wisdom was always that uh, you have a fire um, in one of these, like here's your fire, vent over here and vent over the hallway. Um, I would probably start with venting over the hallway because that allows, that gives me lift for the interior crew to uh, the hose line to advance down, find that. And then the truck or whoever can be working on this vent hole here. And once they've made it, they can call for vent and we punch it. And now it gives them lift to, to get in there. Um, certainly you have to be careful. And the reason I would do that is depends on what our cock loft or attic space is like. I don't want to open this prematurely and the guys are stuck back here because they can't make it all the way in here. Um, and so it's a delay, you know, a few minutes before they get here. Now our attic is fully gone. So uh, I think venting over the center hallway makes a lot of sense. That's the one uh, we were talking about. Uh, was it with the whole class or just with the brothers from this? I don't know. Anyway, uh, we had that, that center hall occupancy where we really should have vented over that. One of the other things to think about too is if you do not have a protected stairwell, so there's no door there, you have a lower floor fire. If you vent over the stairwell, that will keep the fire from going from the first floor up the stairs and filling up the third floor because it'll go right out there. All right, that's kind of the old school uh, tactic that kind of falls in line with what we we're talking about with the uh, new law tenements where they they put the skylight over the stairwell that allows that all that to go out and not fill up the third floor you guys it said you have old ordinary center halls that might be an option for you. you may have windows one of the old center halls he showed us has a window high in that stairwell that would be an option right to, to be able to bend that so it doesn't hit that third floor and bang down if it's an unprotected stair. Um, is it realistic for you guys to do vertical ventilation, do you feel like? I mean, do you feel like you would be able to devote crews to do that? Because center hallway, I mean, really, textbook-wise, you, you really should be trying to vertically ventilate the level call, and if it's a top floor fire, over the fire apartment. I mean, that's what you should do, but I also want to be realistic. If, if that's not something that you guys would do, then I, mean, I don't want to spend a ton of time. Yeah. Well, if we're calling in a Butch Lake company yeah. and we're in the suppression ourselves, that's the assignment that we'll give them yeah. if that's needed. Okay. And that will certainly help if you've sheltered people in place and you've got a dirty 
hallway and you get that opened up and you have your fire control, that's going to help, right? Yeah. Um, you can also pressurize stairwells. So um, in high-rise buildings, they pressurize them. That keeps the smoke out of the stairwells and on the floors. It's really critical if only one's pressurized and one's not. We want occupants to be, be able to come down the pressurized one. They want, we want a really clean one for them. And we'll provide our own pressure. Our second new truck is assigned to bring a fan to pressurize the fire attack stairwell. Yeah. All right. Um, we already talked about all this. So... That, uh, that's it on Center Hall multifamily volumes. Any questions about that? I, I know I kind of worked with the, the group, the brothers. That, um, so I don't want to overcomplicate this for you guys based on staffing. If you have a 200 foot pre connect and your fire is on the second floor and you have good access close to where that fire is located, I mean, maybe shoulder loading a, a 200 foot pre connect is your play if you practice that. So you can you know, deploy that off and you have the ability to you can get up there, drop it down, pull the middle flake back, stretch it, you know what I mean? You're kind of, it's like your pre-connected bundle, really. I mean, I don't know, I'm just saying for ease and speed of deployment, maybe a shoulder-loaded pre-connect actually makes the most sense for you guys, rather than trying to do a high-rise bundle type thing. I, I don't know in, in your specific system, if you guys are, if you do that very often. I would say that's probably the more logical way to if you haven't done and pull your pre-connect part of the way out, invert it, and do shoulder loaded, so you're kind of letting it play off as you go, that is a really good technique because you're taking your hose with you. Right? Do you guys uh, do minute man loads? No. We're, we're using Cleveland and Ontario. Just, I don't know. It's, 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 it's going to be great. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's uh, I just, well, you tell you what, here's the deal. All right, we're getting ready to go out, and what we're going to do, uh, this, the, the drill plan has changed uh, a little bit since uh, I start, first thought it up, um, because uh, the way it set, was set up was not really relevant for you guys. So we want to make it relevant, and, which means you're not going to get a bunch of resources to assist you with the fire attack. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll start with just uh, working through a little bit of those hose stretching techniques and ideas. And I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Uh, maybe we'll, what we'll do is we'll practice a couple different ways that you guys do it. And I can throw in some things that I've seen that, I, that um, uh, I've seen that work well. Keep in mind, I'm a battalion chief now. And it's been about uh, 10 months since I was actually like stretching hose uh, and not just telling people to do it. So, but, uh, but I still, I still feel like I got it. We'll see. Um, and so what we'll do is we, we, we can just trial and error some different ideas for you guys. And I want to, I want to see what you guys can do. Chief is, did, is, are you good with that? Yeah. And then, and then we'll try and, uh, 